for everyone. Thank you for joining us for a very special conversation about the sacred role of grandparents with author Jane Isay, presented by the Center for Children and Youth, a division of Jewish Family and Children's Services. My name is Marina Tickman, and I serve on the Advisory Council for GFCS Center for Children and Youth. I am also past president and a member of JFCS Board of Directors. But most importantly, I'm a grandmother. I have three grandchildren, twins, boys, who are five, almost six, and a four-year-old little girl. She is four going on 40. And as all of you joining us here today, I love and adore my grandchildren. I came to San Francisco with my husband, my parents, and my eldest son over 40 years ago from the former Soviet Union. GFCS has been near to my heart from day one for my parenting skills, grandparenting skills, and the whole journey that we took upon ourselves 40 years ago. When we arrived, GFCS helped us they helped to resettle us, they helped to establish a new life in a new country. The support was essential to my family. Though there were different challenges today raising children, GFCS is helping so many families in our community right now. GFCS has been helping children and their parents and grandparents for over 170 years responding to what people need in the moment and developing services to meet those needs. Seeing the growing needs in our community, GFCS united their services and launched their largest initiative ever, the Center from Ch for Children and Youth. The center brings together world-class services and education to families with international expertise, as well as with the impactful public policy in order to truly transform the lives of children and families. One of those very important support systems is us, grandparents. We have a sacred role in the lives of children and youth, and it is too often overlooked. There are limited resources for grandparents. But in fact, grandparents are critical to child development. We're helping to do the world's most important job. Before we begin the presentation, I just want to say thank you to the many supporters, donors, and volunteers that have made the work of GFCS Center for Children and Youth possible. I invite you to join me in supporting the initiative that is creating a better future for all children, teens, families, and for our community as a whole. Please visit our website or the link in the chat during the talk. I am now pleased to introduce our moderator for this conversation, Stephanie Agnew, Assistant Director of Parent Education at the Center for Children and Youth. Stephanie, has been consulting with and educating parents, teachers, and wider community for many years, and is truly an expert at what she does. She is also expecting her third grandchild any minute now. Stephanie, thank you. Today we are thrilled to welcome Jane Isay, an editor, an author, and grandmother of four. She grew up in a family of psychologists, and as an editor for more than 40 years, she published landmark books on psychology and neuroscience. She worked with renowned experts in the field, from Anna Freud to Mary Piper, and then authored her own books filled with deep insight about complicated family relationships. Her first grandchild was born the week she got an offer to publish her first book, and now there are four grandchildren and four books. As she says, her writing and her family have grown together. Two of her books, Unconditional Love and Walking on Eggshells, Navigating the Delicate Relationship Between Adult Children and Their Parents, 
will be the main focus of our discussion today. Today's conversation is about, is about how we as grandparents can support our grandchildren and adult children during this challenging time. Families everywhere are living with heightened stress and isolation, concerned about the virus and the economic downturn, distanced learning, and political and racial tensions. And here in California, wildfires too. How can grandparents stay connected when travel and together time is limited? And how do we strengthen extended family relationships during this global crisis and beyond? Fortunately, Jane Isay is the perfect person to help us answer these questions and more. Let's begin by watching this short video of a video, the short video of an interview with Jane and her grandson for StoryCorps. Welcome, Jane. How has living through the experience of COVID-19 made you feel? It's terrible. I hate being alone. I hate not being able to see you, Zoe. I hate not being able to hug you, but I can live through it. Are you afraid? You know, I'm not afraid of dying. I've had a great life. I've done my job. What I'm afraid of is losing somebody I love. And that makes me sleepless. My grandmother died in the flu epidemic of 1918, which we're thinking a lot about because we're in a pandemic, right? Yeah. And my mother and her sisters, they were all orphans. And that gave me a sense that you can have troubles and sorrows, but your family, if you're very lucky and you're very loving, it will survive. Toby, what was it like to have COVID? It wasn't great. Are you feeling better now? Mm -hmm. Are you all better? No, not all better, but I'm feeling better. Good. I'm so glad you're feeling better. I want you to be well, and I love you from A to Z and back. You're living through one of the most crazy and consequential times in a century, and you survived. Yep. I love you, brother. I love you, Toby. Well, I'm Jane I say you just saw me and my grandson. Um, every time I, I, I see that little clip, I get weepy. But I should tell you, before I talk about myself and about grandparents and the whole spiel I'm gonna give you, I should tell you a, a little bit about the history of StoryCorps, which is founded and headed by my son, David. And it's, it's a collection of conversations. There are half a million of them or more between people who just need to talk to each other and listen to each other. Where did it begin? My parents, his grandparents were big personalities and uh, we lived in New Haven and they would come and stay with us from New York. And my mother and her sisters, the aunts were the most important and my father, he was wonderful, but my mother was the talker. And one time when we lived in New Haven, David was eight or nine, he had a little cassette tape recorder and he taped a conversation with my mother and with the aunts. Then we moved to New York. He said, mom, where's the tape? I'd lost it. Every six months he'd say, mom, could we find the tape? Well, we couldn't. So when he, uh, went into radio, was a radio documentarian, then he got a MacArthur Genius Award, he had some time free, and then we had 9-11. And he thought of all the conversations that people weren't able to have with the people they loved. So he started StoryCorps. And he, his first call, when he decided to try to do this, his first call was to the Librarian of Congress in charge of the American Folklore um, uh, division, which had the famous narratives, the uh, interviews with slaves, people who had grown up in slavery, known as the slave narratives. And he called her and he said, I'm thinking of doing this. And she said, yes. So all of the conversations from StoryCorps 
are in perpetuity in the Library of Congress, not lost like the tapes from my mother and the ants. So you see, I, you see the beginning of my talk is about the power of grandparents. We didn't set, spend a lot of time with them. She was still working. Uh, she wrote a column for the New York Post and he was still working and we lived in New Haven. We'd go down every six weeks. Um, but she, she was a big personality. He was a big personality and they helped my children become who they are. So, and I didn't have grandparents, as you heard. My, but my mother's parents perished in the flu epidemic and my father was the youngest of eight and they, and he, and they were dead by the time we were born. So I didn't even know how to be a grandparent, um, but I saw my parents be grandparents. And then I had the great pleasure <laughs> of, uh, of Benji and, and Ruby and Toby and, and Maisie. Um, the, um, my first book, uh, Walking on Eggshells, Dave, uh, D Benji was born the day before uh, the book, my editor signed the book. And we, I had actually worked for her. She'd been my boss at Putnam. And, uh, and it was crazy because Benji was premature and they made the deal. My husband was my agent. They made the deal. She called to say, congratulations, and let's talk about the book. And there was a pause. And she said, what's his name? And I said, it's Benji. And there it goes. And we've remained friends all these years. But the reason I was writing this first book after 40 some odd years of, as a book publisher is because my kids were in their 20s and we had done everything, everything we could to give them the opportunity and the strength. They were building their lives. And it was heartbreaking because they weren't answering. They, they were in their own world. I felt as if before they grew up and grew out, we were, think of, a, imagine a fried egg. We were all in the yolk of the fried egg. But as they found their own lives and their work and their loved ones, we became the brown fringe at the, at the end of the, of the white of, of the fried egg. And it was hard. Um, it was really hard. I talked about it, my friends, we talk about it. You know, what's going on with Annie? What's going on with David? What's going on with Shirley? And everyone said, I don't get it. They don't, they don't see, they're too busy. They don't have time for me. And, um, and then, and we all, we would, we'd get a little weepy and then everybody would say, we'd say to each other, I thought I was the only one who was having this problem. And I thought as a book editor, uh, thinking of starting writing, if everybody has the problem and they think they're the only one, this is a problem we can investigate. Um, and my, my favorite story in the beginning of this was my, my younger son, Josh, was running a, a political campaign. He was running... Uh, Chuck Schumer's first campaign for Senate, and he was working so hard. And I knew it, but I wanted to talk to him. This was the, this is in the age of landlines. Remember that? So I left him a message. Hi, Josh, it's mom. Give me a call. One. Message two. Hi, Josh, it's mom. Give me a call. Message three. Uh, hi, Josh, it's uh, mom. I'd love you to call me. Message four. Hi, Josh, this is mom. If you don't call me this afternoon, I'm voting for Al D'Amato. Two minutes later, the phone rang. And, uh, and that's, it, was, it, it, it was helpful for me to see that if I really needed him or if I was joking, if I, if I gave him the idea that I really, I knew what was going on and I wasn't loving it, it was gonna work out all right. But in that book, I wrote, um, I interviewed grown children from 25 to 85, from 25 to 55, and parents from 55 to 85. And the big surprise when I interviewed the grown children was how much they love us. Now remember that, how much they love us. I would, in, every, every young person would start the interview and they'd say, you know, I love my parents. I'm grateful for, to them. Sometimes they said they were grateful for the gift of life. 
And sometimes they said, not only that, but for all the sacrifices. And some of them said, now that I have children, I see how hard it was for them to raise me. And then I'd say, well, how are you doing? And they would say, we're not talking. We're exchanging mean emails. It turned out that the love that these grown children felt for us was hidden. It was like the oil under the shale fields of Texas. But you know, I knew, I found out that it was there. And I found it so comforting and also so comforting to write about. So the question is, how do we, how do we find that love? How do we make it possible for them to be connected with us and, and for us to be connected with them? And I found that the 20s and now into the 30s, it's just like two-year-olds. They say no, they go away. They need to go away so they can come back. And when they get into their 30s, things may get better. When they have children, things may get better. But it's really important for us to know that they love us and to know that they need us to respect their boundaries. And this is before the children. It's more important when the children come. Because I learned in such detail, they hear our criticisms uh, our suggestions, our advice as criticism. It's like, it's a great big loudspeaker. So we say, well, maybe you would put the baby to sleep a little early. You're not taking good care of the baby. So one of the things I suggest in Walking on Eggshells is that we, um, that we limit our advice. One of my friends called it shredded tongue syndrome. Just bite your tongue. Now, that book was written just as my first as Benji was being born and a baby used to pick him up I used to go and spend a morning with him while, while my before my daughter-in-law went back to work so that she could get out and take a walk get a manicure and um I I'd, I'd sing from the song from Mr. Rogers tree 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 and there was a tree in the house and in a potted plant and, I, and he would look at the leaves and she had said I learned from my daughter-in-law that you do not put a baby on its tummy to sleep I thought that was a little crazy because my kids had survived very well sleeping on their tummies and it was easier and one day I was there and Benji had such a tummy ache he was just so uncomfortable he couldn't get comfortable he was tired time for a nap so they had this mat on the floor for the baby and I put him on his tummy um, and she was out and I wasn't sure what to do next. So I put my hand on his back so that I could, I lay down next to him so that I could feel him breathing. And he just fell asleep and he was so much more comfortable. Then I heard the lock in the door opening. I flipped him over. He was still asleep, but I didn't, I, I knew that she would be angry, but I was taking very good care of him because I had my hand on his back. Now, um, I think that it's really one of, the, one, of the, one of the most important things I learned writing this book about the relationship between grown children and uh, parents is that um, we really need to respect their wishes and we really need to treat, teach, treat them like grown-ups. Now when the grandchildren come, this is four books later, I'm writing on an unconditional love. When the grandchildren come, you better have a good relationship with your kids because they have now the great power. They can open their doors and their hearts to you for the, with the grandchildren or they can slam the doors. And I have seen many, many stories, many, many people have told me stories about how they couldn't understand why their daughter-in-law didn't like, one woman, she, she didn't like the way her daughter-in-law cooked. Her, she thought her daughter-in-law killed the beans. And she let her know, well, do you think she really wanted to have this woman around? Not much. She couldn't understand why she wasn't invited over to the house a lot. But I could understand it, and you can understand it. So, all of this is a, is, is a preview to what it's like, what we, to how we can make it easy 
and warm and loving with our children so that we have access to the grandchildren. It's manipulative, ladies and gentlemen. I admit it. But what do we get? We get to give the grandchildren what they need so much. Love of a grandparent is like miracle grow for little ones. We just love them, you know. Now we may spoil them, we may do things that their parents don't love, but most important, we love them. And they love us more than you can know. And this is, this is a sacred bond. I believe that the family is the lifeboat of the human family, the human species. Um, Marina talked about coming here from the Soviet Union with her parents and her grandparents. They had, the lifeboat was filled. Yet the family agency helped to caulk the lifeboat so that they didn't sink when they got here. But this, but it is family. It is family that is the backbone of human life. So our job as grandparents to begin with is to make sure that we have access to the grandchildren and then that we follow the parents' wishes. It, it, at least, you know, you can't give them cookies if their parents don't like them to have cookies. Once they're old enough to talk on te and tell on you, you may, you may not give them cookies. You may um, follow their, their wishes. But it turns out that it's not a big deal. The grandchildren love us anyway. And they even love us when they can't see us. They even love us when all we can do is Zoom. And they even love us when, if, they, if we see them in person, everybody's in masks and nobody's hugging. And they even love us when they don't return our text messages. You just, it's the same oil field, except it's multi-generational. The love of our grown children for us, which they may not show a lot in, in, for much of their lives, is replicated and deeper when it comes to the grandchildren, except we know it when we can be with them. But now we can't be with them. And this, th this great shift of power happened. I call it the Ides of March. In New York, everything was shut down. Everything was working on March 10th, and by March 15th, it was over. We were isolated. And so many of us, I'm sure you experienced this as well, got calls from the grown children. I got one. Hi, Ma, you can't go out. I said, what are you talking about? I'm going to see, I'm going to dinner with my girlfriends tomorrow. My son said, you can't, you have to stay in now. You're 80, you have diabetes, and you have high blood pressure, and we want you to live. So I thought, okay, and I did it. And then they, and then I was going to the theater that Friday, and they, and he said, call the doctor. It was a play I really wanted to see. And I called the doctor and I said, can I go to the theater on Friday? She said, absolutely not. Well, by that Friday, they closed down the theater. So now we were isolated. Now we're alone. We can't see them. We have to protect ourselves, we have to protect them, and we are missing everything. We're missing hugging them. We're missing um, their hugs. You know how it feels when they're little and you walk in the house and they say, Grandma, and they run and hug you? Well, something really to miss. Now, I don't know about you, but in New York, uh, when I walk on the street, they don't even see me. I'm invisible. I'm an old lady. The one group of people to whom I am never invisible is my grandchildren. And that smile and that hug, oh my God, it's the best. So we didn't get that. And the little ones, uh, the four-year-olds and the five-year-olds and the three-year-olds may not be able to do the FaceTime, all they may want to do is jump on the bed. So then you have to say, honey, oh, jump, that's so good. Um, there are all kinds of apps 
where you can read together. There's all kinds of apps that give games that you can play with the grandchildren. Um, and um, if they're interested, there are things you can do. Now, as the kids get older, as they're very young, they can't do that. And when they get to be 10, 11, 12, and teenagers, um, they have better things to do be on the screen with their friends. So they may not have the time. That's okay. They know we love them. And that love and that attention is what is the most important thing we can give them. In the time of COVID, we can be accepting of the fact that they may not want to spend time with us and not be hurt. In the time of COVID, we can be especially kind to our children who are under tremendous pressure. They're working, they have the kids, they're scared, we're all scared. The kids are scared. Um, my my grand, my nine-year-old granddaughter was really, was heartbroken because she couldn't go. We all get together for Passover and Easter in the country. And so we have a Seder on Saturday night and, a, and an Easter egg hunt on Sunday. And Maisie counts the days till the Easter egg hunt. And this year there was, it was canceled. And, and when she would have a fit, she would cry and cry and say, everybody's dying and I miss my Easter egg hunt. Oh, they're true. They're scared, they're worried. Everybody's tense, everybody's anxious, everybody's under pressure. And we have, we can help by just being there and loving them. And I, of course, I have a story about that. So as you saw on the, on the little story core bit, um, Toby, who was 11, had COVID. And it was scary. He had COVID and then he had pneumonia and he wound up with asthma celebrated his 12th birthday under these circumstances. He's been very brave about it. But my son David is the kind of kid, kind of man, who doesn't really want to share the bad with me. He wants to say, oh, it's okay, mom. It's okay. And I found that I got really anxious and I push. Is he okay? What's happening? Is he breathing? And I wouldn't hear anything. And then I realized that what I needed to do was to be David's mother and just be there and just let him tell me what he wanted to tell. The minute I pulled back, I got the full story and it was pretty scary. And it, I, I, I could have dealt with it, but he wanted to protect me. But having to not talk to me and I'm pushing him was not helpful for him. And it was the first time in this, when I, when I just stepped back, it was the first time that I could be my son's mother again. And I could deal with my anxiety and lack of knowledge because I'm supposed to be the grown up. <laughs> Don't feel so much like a grown up during this. You know, I used to play, I used to play gin rummy. What, uh, this same little boy had a concussion. A lot of kids get concussions or they find now that they are concussions when they used to get their heads banged. And he couldn't read and he couldn't watch television. So I teach him, I taught him to play gin rummy. And of course he was quick and good at it, but um, he really didn't like losing. I don't know, five years old, eight years old, don't like to lose. And I won't cheat because I think that's immoral, but I will not try to win. So, and it was just so wonderful to see how he grew just playing gin with grandma. Nothing important nothing big and so that's empathy that is the first pillar the second pillar is perspective now what do i mean by that you know everybody's living in the moment and children think that their parents and their grandparents are perfect and have never had a hard time and what's the matter with them they don't like their teacher they had a fight with children somebody was mean to them they had a they had a meltdown. We have a perspective. If you're old enough to be a grandparent, you've lived some time and you've had your ups and downs and you have lived and you have suffered and you have 
persevered and maybe sometimes you've won and you've had wonderful things happen. That perspective of our lives gives the children an insight into the path that each of us takes. And we don't have to make a sermon. They just see us, they know us. I emphasize, we come from a very uh, successful family and the kids, you can see that they think they'll never be as successful as their parents. So I tell them about all the times I got fired. Now, I'm in, I was in the publishing business and my line is uh, the, the, um, the way to describe a great publishing career is to be hired one more time than you've been fired. So I've told them about my hard times and they love me. And they know it's embedded in them that there's been hard and there's been good. And I have told them the stories of my mother and, 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 and the sisters being orphaned. So they have a sense that you can, you can have really hard times. And I think being orphaned in the flu epidemic of 1918 and not having food and having to, having my aunts worked in a movie theater at the age of five selling candy because they didn't have child labor laws then, that'll stop the kid from feeling so bad. That'll give a kid a sense of how we work and we try and we love each other and we survive. That perspective of our lives, of the good and the bad, is so heartening to kids. I didn't get into my first choice college. Benji's going to apply to college next year. And he says, Grandma, where do you think I should go to school? And I say, please don't choose a place that makes itself famous by how many people it turns down. Because it doesn't really matter. Well, of course, we live in Manhattan and it does really matter, except it doesn't matter to me. So I'm giving him a safety valve for what's going to happen if it happens. And, and that's perspective. The third pillar, so we have empathy and perspective. The third pillar is history. Now this is really important, particularly now, because we are living in a world historic moment. They will tell their grandchildren about being children during the great pandemic of 2020. And, and, and so when I tell them about what I lived through in history, it grounds them. My, and, and I mean, now I say to people, do you remember the Cuban Missile Crisis? We thought the, the world was gonna end. People my age remember polio. You remember polio? We couldn't go swimming, we were so scared. And it looked, they didn't have a vaccine then, Sabin and Salk had vaccines. It was like a miracle. Well, there will be a vaccine and it will be a miracle. But I can tell them about that experience of my own. And um, all of our experiences, our good times and our bad times, took place in history. My favorite story about that is uh, when the same Benji, you know, the first grandchild Teach you how, teaches you how to be, taught me how to be a grandparent. And I've spent more time with him because he's four years older than the next. He said to me, Grandma, what was it like, what was it like growing up in Washington during World War II? My father was assistant to the Surgeon General. My mother was in the government. We were in the New Deal, edges of the New Deal. And I said, well, you know, we loved it and it was really great, but we hated living in Washington because it was a segregated city. And she said, no, Grandma, that's impossible. That's where Abraham Lincoln lived. Well, sure, Abraham Lincoln lived in Washington. And he was the great hero of, of anti-slavery. But there was Jim Crow when I was growing up. And he needed to know that. And so it is. We have all of these moments in our lives that attach to national and world events. And I think particularly now, when we're in this historic moment, that is helpful because the message that they're getting may be the story, but the underlying message is lived through it, survived. And each of these stories is like a parable or an Aesop's fable because underlying these little anecdotes is, I love you, I'm fine, I survived, and so will you. 
Now the fourth pillar of the moral imagination is, I call it agency. And you might call it, or I might call it more, more familiarly, you can do it, honey. It's really important because the parents are worrying about what will happen to them. Somebody wants to be an actor or an, a poet, what, what will happen? They'll be in debt, what, what do we do? We can say, take some acting lessons, dance for me. And that just gives them a sense of a kind of possibility and a kind of, I'll support you and I'll love you, what you do, whatever you do, that doesn't go against the parents' desires, but it gives them confidence. Um, one of the people I interviewed um, for the grandparent book was a, uh, grew up in the South and she spent the summers with her step grandparents. And her grandpa was, he was a redneck. He had a truck. He would, he, the grandchildren would be at the farm and he would take a great big tarp and he would attach it to the back of his truck and they would get on the tarp on pillows and he would drive the truck around until they all fell off. That would not be a possibility in this era. I'm just telling you. And she loved him. And every night he built a fire. There was a fire pit. He built a fire and he sat by the fire. And one evening she came out jet propelled. She was so angry cause her. And she, he said, what's the matter, darling? And she said, they don't want me to be an actress. And I want to be an actress. He was very quiet. He just looked up and pointed to the stars, pointed to the sky. And she said, what's that, Papa? And he said, I'm seeing your name in the stars, darling. She's a graduate of Juilliard. She's not had, and we, and she will have whatever success she has when she wins that award, her mind will go to Papa with his hand pointing to the stars. These are things we do. These four pillars of, of, of the moral imagination are built in quiet times in not important times. And they're built, they can be built on Zoom and they can be built on FaceTime and they can grow even when we're under difficult circumstances. I find with my grandchildren that, well, I, basically they don't wanna to talk to me because this has been six months and mainly they're on their phones or they're playing games. And I just say, I love you. Look up and say, yeah, grandma. That's all. They need, I need to express this. And I think they need it too. Now, our needs as grandparents are very specific. We need love. We need attention. We need com community. We need, we need people. And those of us who haven't been out much are kind of suffering. One of the, uh, I, ru I run a webinar for a, a, a retreat center in Massachusetts. And one of the women had the best, best story about this. She's got grown grandchildren, the, the oldest are in college and a couple are teenagers. And she was talking with, with the 13 year old girl and she was saying how sad she is and how lonely she is. And the granddaughter said, Grandma, there are all those cartons in your attic. Go find out what's in them. So she did. And she found things that had, she had been given by her grandmother. So you know what she did? She took pictures of the most interesting ones and she texted the picture with a story to all the grandchildren. Did they answer her? Who cares? They didn't all answer her. Those grandchildren aren't always gonna answer us now, but she had the experience of making, walking across that bridge to the children. And this is so restorative to her. She needed to do it. We need for our own well-being to connect in some way and to share the love with 
our grandchildren. Each of us, depending on the age, we have opportunities to connect with them. Um, we can help them with their schoolwork if they feel like it. We can read to them, we can talk to them, we can do art with them, and we can watch them jumping on the bed, or, and we can play games with them. As they get to be teenagers, in my experience, it gets harder because they're in their own heads. So what we do is we send them a note, send them a picture, and if we get to be with them, we don't, it's not about us, it's about them. If they want to watch, I don't know, we got basketball again. I was, I, I have visited my children in the country and all they wanted to do was watch these basketball games. I'm not a sports person. I sat with them for a while, but then I thought, I hate basketball. I'm not going to do this. It was okay. I said, I love you, Ruby. I love you, Benji. They said, I love you, Grandma. That was good. And my last point here is about love. So I, um, I had a birthday last week, and I got birthday cards. And one of them said, you mean the world to me. Is there anything better than that? We are there for them. They love us. We're going to survive COVID. We're going to survive the turmoil. We've survived bad before. How many, where were you when John Kennedy died? Where were you in the Rots riots? Where were you in all of these experiences we've had? And it feels now we're swimming in a sea of uncertainty, but things will resolve. Our job is to keep up the hope, to keep up the love, to keep up the energy, and to keep up the connection. And if we can do that, we have fulfilled the sacred mission of grandparents in COVID. So that's what I have to say. Do we have some questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. That was inspiring, helpful, fun to Thank hear you. stories. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of us were in, enjoying the stories and relating to those, some of them too. Um, so yes, we do have some questions. Good. Um, and um, I will say they're kind of all over the place, so we'll just start with some. <laughs> Good. Uh, one of the questions is, um, why do the grandchildren act better with grandparents than they do with their parents? Uh -huh. As soon as the parents get home, they start acting up and change their attitude. That's such a great question. It's, it's true. And I think it's because they have, they have issues they're working out with their parents. And they, with us, it's just unadulterated love. And they are better. And the minute, and, and I often, I often suggest, it's hard now, take them away from the parents. Be alone with them. They will be so agreeable. And when the parents come back, they, they, they just turn into children of the parents again. And they, what they're working out is growing up, growing away. And what we're working out is love. I have one trick I do when I'm alone with one of the grandchildren. We all, I, I pick them up from school or lessons. So now it's time for lunch. We're going to go out for lunch. And I know where we are and I pick, and there are all the restaurants on the street are fine. And, and Maisie will say, where are we going for lunch, grandma? And I say, anywhere you like, darling, mm -hmm. you should see the smile. Anytime we can say anything you like, darling, we're giving them the opportunity. Of course, the choices are all good. It just, it's so wonderful. And they're just, and the parents, you know, the parents have a job to do. They have to treat, give them manners. We have to give them love and so on. But there's always the case. And thank you for the question. <laughs> That's great. Um, there's a couple people who have asked if you could tell us a little more about your thoughts around older grandchildren, the teenager and young adults. And I remember yes. from your book, I loved some of the things you brought out. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about the older grandchildren and how to stay connected to them. That, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, I, uh, 
in in my book, I I I was able to talk with a, a handful of of grandchildren who had who were grown-ups, and they were lucky enough to have grandparents who were still alive. And this seems to me to be the best in life, she said, <laughs> without exaggeration, because you've had all these years of just loving them and knowing everything about them, and they trust you, and you trust them, and it's a relationship of, equ it's almost a relationship of equals. The grown grandchildren, I'm talking about grandchildren out of co in college or out of college, the grown grandchildren um, may not want to talk about thinking of dropping out of college or going, taking a year off. They don't want to talk to their parents about it yet because they're going to get in trouble, but they'll talk with us. And they, we can be reliable sounding boards for them. And we're smart enough to know how to treat them because we love them. We've known them all their lives. Um, and we also, we are, we're models for them as they get older. One of my favorite stories from the book is a, a story about a young man named Benno, whose grandmother had fled the Nazis, Oma, and she had hidden, and then they went to Latin America where they lived for many years, came to the Bronx where she met Opa, and they had three children. And now Oma became blind, was losing her sight, and she became blind. The only of his siblings that she ever saw was this older boy, Benno, because by the time the other kids were born, she couldn't see. But she had a, she had a seeing eye dog and she managed. And they talked, Benno would call her. She lived in New Jersey, he lived in Brooklyn, no car. He would call her and talk to her for hours on Sundays. What did she talk about? Everything and nothing. She was so smart, she was so funny. And, and, then, she, she, and then she died and I asked Benno about her what happened when she died. And he described the hospital room. She'd had a lot of heart attacks and this was clearly the last one. And I, he said, we were all sitting around, we got sandwiches, we watched the heart monitor and we knew that she was going and then she died. And I said, well, how did you feel? And he said, I thought to myself, if I live a life where at the end I am surrounded by my family and the people I love, it will be a life well lived. Then they put together, the family raised money to train a seeing eye dog in her memory. And they all went to the ceremony where the seeing eye dog was given to the family. And I said, well, what a What's the dog's name? Well, you know what it was. It was Oma. <laughs> and that is, that is what happens. That is what happens. They, they call, they call grandma or grandpa in the car. I met a girl. They know that we're not, that we're, that we're going to keep, we're, we're not going to blat to the parents. And it, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. The time when they're teenagers, is really rough because teenagers are really rough. So that that our job then is to say, you you want you want to stay with me for a while. This is non-COVID. Talk to me. I love you. If you don't want to talk, I love you. If you do want to talk, I love you. And we can be a refuge for them. We can also be a refuge for their parents. I actually I was I my this this. This kid I keep talking about is 16 and he's getting really snarky with his father. And every time it happens, I laugh because I remember when his father was that age, I thought, just you wait, you're going to have the same problems. But he's a better boy than his father was. And I said to him last week, I said, Benji, you're not nearly as terrible a teenager as your father was. <laughs> um, and, 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 and they also have, they may... I have a friend whose grandson was really not getting along with his mother. They live in the same city. And um, he's got seven or eight grandchildren. And he, it was really bad and he was not following the rules of the house. So they said, could he 
the parents said, could we send him to live with you for a couple of weeks? And he said, sure. He's in his 90s. He said, sure. And, and the grandson came and he said to his grandson, you have to follow my rules or you have to go home. That My grandmother was one of, I had a grandmother like that too, who lived in Iowa and my cousin got sent away to live with her from California. Uh-huh. Yes. Summer. Um, but I'm not sure she was as good at showing the love as you, as you probably are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but, and, and there, there were in that generation, in the, in the generation of your grandma, this was not, it was a different style. It was a different style of parenting. It was a different style of grandparenting. We are the most engaged and the most involved since the old country where everybody lived together in a shack or <laughs> in a shtetl or, you know, or somewhere. We're, we are in many ways reconnecting with, our, with, with the past where everybody was closer and where grandparents had a lot more to do with the children, with the grandchildren. Jane, we have some questions now switching to the younger group again. Yes. Um, or anyway, the younger group um, about recommend, well, this one is uh, recommending some specific apps for children who are six years old and un under. I want to add that they also are saying gratitude for your wisdom, sharing love to you. Um, Thank you. So uh, in addition, um, how do grandparents, um, who live only 15 minutes away, still work on um, developing their relationship with a six-month-old and a two-year-old? How do they bond with them? Um, I think a six, I think if you can't hold them, you ha what you do with a six-month-old yeah. is you say to yourself, I will love you when I hold you. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things, one of the things we, we need to remember, the perspective the immigrant families who left their whole family and never saw them again. Maybe there'd be a letter. It took six months. The people who, the, the pioneer families where everybody, they got, they, they got in the stagecoach or whatever they got in. They got on the train. They went to Chicago. Somebody's here from Chicago. They went to Chicago from New York. They didn't see them. But the lot there, it's hard. It's miserable particularly with, with, with small babies, because you really have to be careful about them and they have to be careful about you. It, the, what you say, what I say to those of those, you wonderful loving grandparents who are heartbroken over a six month old is in six months you'll see them and you'll love them then and they'll love you. Because the connection will take what, no time at all, it'll be instantaneous. Mm -hmm. For the toddlers, um, you know, I don't have a list of apps. But go, there are, sing with them, sing a song, see if you can get the, while they're, they, they can't concentrate on a screen. So sing them a song while they're dancing. Find, think of the things that, the things that, um, the things that you used to do, there's probably a way of figuring it out on one of these technologies. Um, I think it's really important for us to know that we are smarter than we think we are. We're more adaptable than we think we are. We're more creative than we think we are. There are ways, talk with your friends, figure it out. You would be amazed if you can take a yoga class from a top yoga person a thousand miles away, you can figure out how to do cutouts with the grandchildren. I, uh, my, I, one of my, my first cousin is a nurse, school teacher uh, teaches four-year-olds and at a Jewish um, uh, school in in the Washington area they she had the four-year-old making a Torah this distanced she'd read a story from the Bible they'd make a picture they'd show the picture they tell her what it was they'd color it and they put it aside and at the end they taped all the pages together and they rolled them around sticks and they had their Torah. The Torah of family and of connection, we can do it. Do your research. Don't feel bad about not being good at it and give it a shot. Um, you, can do, uh, there's, you can draw with them. 
because you draw, they draw, and you show each other the pictures. Make sure that there are crayons that, that in, in your grandchild's house, there's, there's got to be art supplies. You, oh, you can also do, um, one of the things Janie does is she, they have kind of a treasure hunt and, and get your grandchild to choose five things from the house that are round or green or uh, interesting and come, come to you with them and make up stories about that. You can write down the stories and send it by, send it as an attachment. I mean, we do have this great tool of the internet, and we can, uh, and we have, we can draw, we can write, we can sing. Um, you can you can tape a song and send it digitally, and get get them. See if you can get them to tell you a story, and tape it, and then you, you have it. I've been so those are a couple of things. I've been absolutely amazed at how good my very young grandchildren are at communicating and talking over the screen. Um, I know my own- That is great. When they were young, I couldn't get them to talk to their grandparents on the phone if, my, if their life depended upon it. And it was always so right. frustrating. But in today's world, I think children are much better at it. Of course, in person is always the best, but under these circumstances, there's not much more we can do sometimes. Here's another question, Jane, that sort of leads, it's a COVID-related question, but I think it would be great for you to generalize it a little more into non-COVID times as well. And I know you have a lot of ideas about boundaries and accepting your, your adult children's boundaries. So um, this, this person said she's been getting resentful and sad and angry because her son and daughter-in-law are very rigid about how much she can see her grandchildren during COVID. And she's yeah. trying to hide her feelings, but she's feeling so sad about it. And what can she do to try to help herself accept the boundaries that her adult children are setting around the grandkids? And I think that's true, not just about COVID things. There's lots of boundaries that our kids set that we may or may not feel good about. How do we handle those feelings that we sometimes have? Let me talk COVID first, because I don't know any grandparent who didn't feel bad when the grown children said you can't see the kids or you have to wear a mask. It's, it's, like, ta it's like taking away the keys to the car. It takes our power away and it, we take it personally. I think that the way in which we deal with COVID related safety issues is, a, is an emotional hot button. If I see somebody not wearing a mask, I'm a mask person, I think, what kind of bad person are you? If I, if, if somebody says, well, let's do, we could go inside to this restaurant, I'm not going and I'm feeling bad about it. For, for us to have to abide by our children's laws when it comes to COVID, it, it's, it's a growing experience. It's, and I, when it first happened, when my kids started giving me these rules and regulations, I, I said to myself, I really hate this. Who are they to tell me what to do? And then I thought, well, I guess they don't want to bury, ha have me buried without a shiva because <laughs> I'd be dying alone in the hospital and they'd feel a little worse about it. And then I thought they really love me. They're protecting me. And it hurts. And I don't like their tone. I don't like to be told what to do. I'm old enough to be your mother, God damn it. But it's, it's done from protection and it's done from love. And most importantly in this time, we are floating and we're swimming in a sea of ignorance. Everybody has a different opinion about our health, our safety, testing, whatever. So we, there's no single reliable authority and so we don't have a way of saying, well, I'll check with one authority, we'll all agree. But there are so many disagreements. And that uncertainty is such an attack on our sense of life and reality. It's also an attack on the children and the grandchildren. So if you could just pull yourself out of it and realize that maybe, just possibly, they're doing it out of love, Maybe you'll feel better. And the other thing is, it's going to be over. 
but it really sucks, I must say. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to add about boundaries in general and, and when you're... Oh, when sure. You're Thank you. Boundaries that you don't maybe feel good about one way or another? This is... Yeah, I thank you. Yes, I, I have a lot to say about boundaries because we need to honor them. Good fen Robert Frost said, good fences make good neighbors. And he was right. And if we honor their boundaries, we are showing them respect. All they want from us is respect. They want us to think that they're, they're, a, they're wise enough and grown up enough to set their l rules. And it's hard for us because we think we're old enough to be their parents and that we've raised them and they should know that we have good judgment. Times change. It, I suggested actually in, in uh, walking on, on in uh, unconditional love, I, I suggest that, what, um, that when you find out that your first grandchild is coming, you've got at least three or six months to do some studying and you should, you should study new child rearing um, rules and regulations as if you were researching a trip to Morocco. Find out whether they can sleep on their tummies. Find out uh, what, the, what the latest lore is on diet. Learn the environment that they're in because that is the environment they trust. It, it may be a stupid website that you think is ridiculous. It's their website. Understand it. And if you do that, and you do it assiduously, the door will be open when the when the children when the grandchildren are born. And it's in, and I I did a, a series of focus groups with the with the parents for for the grandma book for unconditional love. And I what makes the make, makes the parents of the grandchildren crazy? Presence. They say, we say to my parents, don't bring a gift. And they always come with something. And, I, and, and, the, and the, the playroom, I can't walk barefoot because it's got all these tiny pieces of plastic. Why don't they listen to me? I had it happen to me uh, when I go out to, when I went out to Brooklyn, I always brought books or art supplies. Very classy, Grandma. Uh, when I went, I used to make, go out and make chicken dinner because I have two working those are two working parents and they were not eating right. And, um, and one day I didn't have anything. And my granddaughter said, do you, ha you have something for me, Grandma? And I said, oh, I forgot, Maisie, I'm so sorry. And her mother said, Maisie, Grandma's presence today here is gift enough. And I realized that I shouldn't bring any more presents. <laughs> it was fine. But but it is, a, it is, it's a way of saying, you know, they are separating from us. Even when they're 50 or they're 60, if we're alive, they still have the childhood conflict. I am told regularly about the mistakes I made when my sons were teenagers. They're in their 50s. <laughs> it's just the way it is. But if we can, by, by honoring their wishes, we set them free. And when they are free, they will come back to us. And I think that is the beauty of honoring boundaries. Think of it as manipulation. You'll get them back and you'll get them fully. So just do it. And if you have a complaint, oh, this is a very important lesson for me. If you have a really serious complaint, call a girlfriend. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> That's really it. Because this is, this, we have the joys from when they're babies till they're grown-ups, of having grandchildren in our lives, that trumps any judgment about seatbelts. Remember seatbelts? It used to be a deal. It's not a deal now. Mm -hmm. Jane, here's a, um, a couple of questions that, that relate, again, sort of off on a different, different topic. The other grandparents. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, uh, how do you handle the situation in which your values and the rules are very different from the other grandparents? I get to watch TV at Nana's house, 
Um, and then in addition to that, well, sort of the same thing, how, wh what do you recommend on how to relate to the other grandparents if they are a bit difficult? <laughs> Um, yes, well, this is a very important thing, and thank you for the question. It's a really good subject. Um, initially, I find that grandparents are jealous of what the other grandparents, how much time they spend with the grandchildren. And I suggest that they buy a Fitbit that counts the minutes that the in-laws are spending with the children so that then you can get your minutes. Um, there are, um, these are very, all I can say kind of shortly, because I see we're almost out of town time, is get your head on straight. If the grandchildren say, I can watch television at Nana's, you can say, but you're here now. You can set different rules. You don't have to agree. I have found that in-laws that really love each other and are close friends, and that does not mean necessarily the marriage will last. It, it's two different worlds. I think now in COVID, if one set of grandparents is very liberal with letting the children go and play with other people and another set is not, you've got an issue, you've got to figure it out. But by and large, there's the competition between the two sets of grandparents. I don't know, it's not in the Bible, it should be, it's eternal. <laughs> and what I find the most useful way to do deal with it is to say, live and let live they these people whom i don't care for and i don't agree with their politics and and third second opinion they're boring they're giving the children love and anybody who gives the grandchildren love is somebody i love next and again when they say things that really annoy you call your girlfriend i think i think girlfriends and and, and all kinds of friends are really important in the continuity of families because when you're really annoyed, you 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 can blow off steam, and 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 it's important for us to figure out a way not to put our kids in in the in the position of in the hot spot between the two sets of parents. I find by and large that mothers of sons have more trouble with the daughters-in-law than they have with their daughters, but in many cases, the complicate the relationship, mother-daughter relationship is fraught and difficult. It's all difficult. We are the grown-ups in the room and we can keep our cool if we can. And don't take it personally. It's Their values don't have anything to do with you. That's great advice. <laughs> One last question, I think, and then we'll be closing. Um, thank you so much for all of your wonderful insights. Uh, here's uh, someone who has asked about grandchildren who are a bit shy or slow to warm and wondering how to establish a stronger relationship because when they're together, they tend to hang around their parents more and it, it feels hard to connect with them. Um, these kids are older, they're 14 and 12 year old twins. Okay. Like being teenagers as much as anything. <laughs> I, I'm glad you. Thank you for the question, and I'm glad that you put in the ages, because you're right. When they get that age, they really, it's so weird. Their behavior may be very different from their feelings, and it's hard, it's hard as a grandparent not to get the hug. You know, when, when they're little, you walk in the house, and they run and give you a hug. When they're teenagers, they're at the computer, they say, hi, Grandma, and they go back to the screen. It's really, really hard. So what we need to do is just remind them that we love them and remind ourselves that they love us. Because this is a period, um, I always considered teenage years as a long tunnel. And at the end, of, they go into the tunnel at 12 or 13 and they come out at 17 or 18. There are flashes of light. You see the good in them. When you arrive at the destination, it's that kid, better and older, but it's been a long trip. And grandparents get on the same train as the parents. Sometimes when there's conflict, they may come to you or be sent to you. But um, the only way to get them, the only thing to do is to tell them, show them you love them and, and remind yourself that they may be ignoring you, but they're ignoring everybody else 
in the family. And again, it's not about you. And, and let them, if there's something that you can do with them, take them somewhere, let's have breakfast, something like that. That's wonderful. And if it does, with, in COVID, so we're not having breakfast, remember that life is long and they'll come back. Teenagers are impossible. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that <laughs> analogy of the tunnel, but I, I remember reading it in your book. It really stuck out to me. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. Thank well, you. thank you, Jane, so much for your wisdom, your guidance, and your thoughtful approach to how we can keep our families close during these uncertain and lonely times. You've given us encouragement and much to think about as we navigate our grandparenting journey. And thank you also to Lori and to Marina for helping me moderate today's discussion. The Center for Children and Youth is pleased to have been able to welcome you, Jane, to our community. And I'd also like to thank all of our participants for joining in this special event today. We're here for all families during this challenging time. We can help through vir virtual family con consultations or teletherapy for children and teens. Please reach out if you or someone you know needs support. Call us at 415-359-2443. You can also help us ensure that children and families have access to critical services regardless of their ability to pay by donating at ccy.jfcs.org donate. Until next time, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>